The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. All right, let's take our Bibles, if you would, and open them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. But today, I would like for us to look at the last verse of this first chapter. And you may still be trying to find that, but I want to go ahead and read it. And then when you find it, you can keep your Bible open to it because this verse will be our subject today. Verse number 10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. This is a remarkable verse. Last week we spoke on this as well, and I showed you that this verse is wide-ranging in its articles of the Christian faith. It extends from the deity of Jesus Christ in heaven to the necessity of his incarnation to come as a human to this earth. It speaks of Jesus Christ, who is the substitute for sin, who died, that he would redeem us to God. And that we sang about in just a, mo just a moment ago, the power of the cross. It speaks of the resurrection of Christ that is the validation by the Father of the redemptive work that Jesus did there. The, the resurrection said that God put his approval on it. Then it also speaks of the helplessness and the depravity of all people. A depravity that is so deep and so radical that it required the death of the Son of God for sin to remedy the problem that we have. And then it speaks of heaven and that Christ will return from heaven and there is sure hope that he will take us to heaven when he comes back for us. And then it speaks of that awful prospect of hell that those who die without Christ will suffer the terrible consequences of unbelief. There is wrath coming on those who do not believe. Now we're reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 1. He said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now this morning in just a few minutes of introduction, I've already discovered to you the reason that we preach the gospel of Christ. If there is one verse of Scripture in the Bible that is as extensive in its doctoral references as this verse, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, I don't know what that verse is. As I've told you last week, nearly every word merit further investigation. It contains many sermons. And today I've chosen the last three words of this verse as the subject of the message today, which is the wrath to come. Now, uh, about a month ago, I was preaching on the proofs of salvation, and I warned of the danger of a false profession. And I spent a few minutes, few minutes discussing the, the, the consequences of thinking that you are a Christian when you are really not, and how terrible it will be to appear before Christ at the judgment only to hear him say, depart from me, I don't know you. And the place that God will tell people to depart is this terrible, awful, burning hell that is the destiny of everyone who doesn't believe. Well, after I preached the sermon, you know that Jorge had to comment on it. Uh, he keeps a tally sheet of the numbers of times that I say hell in my messages. And I believe he said the tally for that day was 42 times that you said hell in the sermon. And uh, I, he said something interesting to me after that. I had to think about it for a minute. He said, it's been a long time since you had that much to say about hell. And then he sent me a text that evening and he encouraged me to keep preaching on hell. And he said, I have, Mina and I have relatives that, that have not come to Christ and he was sure that they would die and go to hell. Well, we should keep on preaching on, on hell, but hell's not exactly my favorite subject. And it's not the favorite subject of most preachers. And because it's not, and because people don't want to think about hell, you will rarely hear a message about hell today. Hell is a subject that people want to avoid. It's an unpleasant subject. Unpleasant subjects hurt the popularity of the preacher. And so preachers want to stay away from it. 
But the truth of the matter is that every time that we avoid the subject of hell, there are people that are dying and they're on their way there and they could benefit from someone who would tell them about that awful place. And we must tell people, uh, I've got to tell preachers, first of all, don't avoid preaching about hell. Preach hell and tell people they must do everything to avoid that awful place. Now you remember in this letter that the apostle wrote to answer questions and to assure the Thessalonians about their faith. They misunderstood the return of Christ. And, and uh, in each of the chapters, Paul referenced this, that Christ will return. There's a sure reality of Christ's return. And you're to look forward to that. As the people of God, we are to keep looking forward to Jesus, that he will come. And, and in this verse, this verse that we're studying, he added the purpose of Christ's return is to take these people from the awfulness of the suffering and persecution that they were under and to deliver them also from the wrath that is to come. And the basis of their hope is this fact, Christ will return. This is the reason that we need him. His salvation is to deliver us from the wrath to come. And that wrath that is coming is far worse than anyone can imagine. Now to get a glimpse of the horrible nature of God's wrath, you only need to look at what it takes to avoid God's wrath. It took the death of Jesus Christ. Now, although many of us in this room have been Christians for many years, I doubt that there's one of us that understands completely the gravity of this statement that Christ, the Son of God, died. I don't think that we really understand all of that. We don't understand the great condescension of Philippians 2 where it tells us that God came down from heaven to experience the torturous death of the cross. You see, to kill the Son of God must mean that our circumstances are so dire that there's nothing in all the world that would deliver us from it. There is no help for us outside of this. The Son of God must die because sin is such a horrible thing. And you need to think about that when you decide that you're not going to live for the Savior. When you decide that you're going to go your way and do what you want to do and ignore the Word of God, you need to remember what we just sang about, the power of the cross. It's the cross that, that was necessary to save us from our sins. Well, in the death of Christ to pay for our sins, the full fury of God's hatred against it had to be unleashed on Jesus. And if you read the story of Christ's crucifixion, you might think, well, the cross was not really all that bad, was it? Thousands of people died on crosses in those days. The Roman government used crucifixion as a way to strike fear into the hearts of people. You defy us, this is what will happen to you. You will be crucified. And so we know that on the same day that Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves that were hanging on crosses. And there were two thieves that were sacrificed in the same way that Jesus was, well, theirs wasn't a sacrifice, but they died in the same way that Jesus died. So what is the difference? What makes the death of Christ so amazingly spectacular? What makes it so different from those two thieves that died on either side? Well, the difference is that Christ did not surrender his life to Jews and Romans. Christ did not surrender his life to man, but he surrendered his life to God. And the punishment that was placed on him was God's punishment. It wasn't to satisfy Rome for any crime that he did. There was no crime. But it was to satisfy God for all the crimes of all of those who deserved to be punished by the wrath of God. And so Jesus, the God-man, suffered the fury of hell for all that would believe in him. And only Jesus was capable of that intense agony. One sin is worth infinite punishment. Now consider all of your sins. Consider the cost of all of your sins for your entire life. And then take the sins of all of those who... who would believe in Jesus Christ and the cost of all those and roll all of that together and imagine how much that would take to pay for it all and that's what Christ did. 
What Jesus did on the cross was to take the punishment that hell would have extracted for every one of those sins that we have committed. And I want you to understand that the suffering of Christ was real. And this is proof that hell is real because what the Father put on the Son as he hang on the cross, hung on the cross was hell. The wrath of God is when God puts hell on unbelievers because of their sins. Because those sins are not on Christ. And when Paul said that we wait for his son to deliver us from the wrath of God to come, he means the fury of hell. Now think of that again. If God's wrath would be on his son, the one that God said he loves beyond measure, the one that God said, this is my son in whom I delight, if our sins were so heinous that God would sacrifice him and put hell on him, then what do you think that he would do to those who are his enemies, those who have never been reconciled to him. Oh, you can be sure that the full fury of God's wrath will be on them for eternity. Oh, Paul wrote the church to assure them, to assure believers that the wrath of God will not fall on them. If you are a child of God, the Son of God will come from heaven to deliver you. And if you should die before he comes, just rest in this, the deep gratitude that you should have for God saving your unworthy soul. But if you're that person who is an unbeliever, or if you're that person who is self-assured and self-deceived, thinking that you know Christ when you don't know him, then you should very, very carefully consider how awful is the wrath to come. Well, God's wrath is a monumental subject. I dare say that his wrath is as, ex as extensive as his love for every part of God's love has an opposite to it that incurs God's wrath. But our outline is brief today. We're going to examine just a few of the Bible's comments about hell. It's not all that the Bible has to say. You'd have to spend a great deal of time reading everything the Bible says about hell. And others have noted that it says more about hell than it does about heaven. But let's just briefly observe a, a few facts that the Bible gives us about hell or the Bible teaches about this awful place that is called hell. The first that we would see is that hell is a real destination. That hell is a place where people go. It's not imaginary. It wasn't invented as a mind game of preachers to try and persuade you to do what, the, what is right. It's not a scare tactic even though it is a very scary place. It's not God's trick, and it's not a metaphor for a tough life, as you hear some people say. It's not a metaphor for a, treat, a tough life. It's not, it's not a metaphor for a dis disappointing eternity. Hell is not a metaphor for anything. Hell is a real place. Hell is a place where people go, and they go there because in their lives they were disobedient and they did the wrong things. But you also need to understand that hell is not avoided by doing good things. And this is because your God, your good rather, and, and God's good are different. And according to God's good, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means that every person is a sinner. Every person has broken God's law. All are disobedient. And the only thing that hell has to do with how good you are is that you're not good enough. And you'll never be good enough to escape hell. You're going to be punished because your sins are against the holy God. There are some people who deny the existence of both heaven and hell. There are few. You don't find very many. Uh, they've been educated against it because it's not natural for people to deny that there is either a heaven or a hell. Everybody, almost every culture that you could ever think of has a concept of eternal bliss and also of eternal punishment. All people know that there is a God. We understand there is a God, and we also know there is guilt. And so in every place that you go, you find that people are going to try to be good enough, try to do something that will help them to avoid punishment, because they believe that punishment is sure to come. Well, the Bible clarifies this for us. It tells us what that punishment is, and it also tells us how to avoid that punishment. And the Bible tells us that both heaven and hell are eternal places. 
In the same terms that the Bible uses to describe the reality and the length of heaven and hell, God says this is a real place that people are going. Hell is as real as heaven is real. In Matthew eleven twenty three, Jesus used both of these terms in the same sentence that show us that heaven and hell are equally real. He said, And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. This isn't my subject today, but do you notice the sin that merits special attention in this verse? Jesus used the vilest sin imaginable, both to Jews and to God, when he compared Capernaum to Sodom. And he said their refusal to come to him was worse than the sin of Sodom. And that's his way of saying that sodomy is a horrible sin. It's only one step above Capernaum's total rejection of Jesus Christ in death in the fires of hell. I was asked not long ago, what does your church teach about God's love? What does your church say about love? And I said, well, we teach that God loves sinners. That God sent Jesus Christ into this world to save sinners. And all of us are sinners. The next question that came is, well, what does your church think about lesbianism? I think the implication was that God then must love the LBGTQ and that God's okay with all of that. And I said, no. I said, that is a lifestyle that is not God's intent for his creation. And that is a lifestyle that must be repented of. That is a sin that must be repented of. And this is one of the many places in the Bible that Jesus very clearly showed that he's not okay and he's not tolerant with those lifestyles. He said, as wicked as Sodom. And he said, they would have repented if they'd seen the mighty works that God did in Capernaum through Jesus. And then another point that I added, it's what the Bible says that's important. It's not what any church says. The church receives its authority from the Bible, and so the church is only correct as long as it agrees with the Bible. So you can find a church that says these things are okay, but that doesn't agree with the Bible. They're not the authority. God, in his word, is the authority. So we see that Jesus' reference to heaven and hell shows that hell is as real as heaven. If you believe him about heaven, then you must also believe him about hell. And as much as heaven is a peace and good and happiness and all glory, hell is equally the opposite. It's all bad. It's all discouragement. It's all hate. It's all distress. It's all pain and suffering. Heaven is superlative in its joy. And hell is superlative in its misery. Three times in Mark 9, Jesus said, Hell is a place where the fire is never quenched. He said their worm does not die. And he meant that those in hell are there forever. They never go out of existence. They're always in hell. They are never consumed by that fire. They are given bodies that are especially suited for that awful place. And bodies in hell will burn forever and forever and never be burned up. Revelation confirms it in chapter 19 verse 20 where it says the smoke of the torment rises forever and ever. That it is a lake of fire that burns with the intensity of brimstone. You can read that in Revelation chapter 20. And it's worth mentioning again the brimstone that is another reference to Sodom and Gomorrah described in Genesis 19:24 as burning with brimstone when fire fell from God in heaven to consume those awful places. Is hell a real destination? Well, you might find this interesting. There is a road that goes there. There is a highway to hell. Jason Gertz, I think, would agree with me that AC and DC did not invent that highway. There is a highway to hell, and they weren't the first to recognize it. There is a road to hell that is a multi-lane freeway. Jesus said it's the Broadway, and it leads to destruction. And there are so many people that are on the Broadway going to hell that there are, are people who think it must be the right way to go. This is where everybody's going, so let's just join them. Let's all stay here. This must be the place to go, and there's plenty of company there. Enjoy it. 
But folks, all these people, they're not going to the beach. Hell is not the beach. It's not warm like the beach in Cabo. It's, well, you know, it, it's as hot as hell. The hell is an inferno. It's a very terrible place. Hell is destruction. I'm sorry I can't locate it on the map. There's a road that goes there, but I don't know where you locate it on the map. The Bible doesn't give its location. It's not in a dimension that human eyes can see or people in this body as it is can go there. Some say that hell is in the center of the earth. Some say that hell is outside the universe. I don't know. I just know that the Bible says there is a road that goes there. And it also tells me there's nobody who has trouble finding the road. There's a road that goes there, and if you were born, if you're a human, you were on the way. Now, although the Bible says that those that are on the way to hell are lost, it doesn't mean they can't find it. That's not what it means by lost. No, there are carpools and there are ride shares that go there. There are even churches that load up busloads to send to hell. You're never going to get off that highway because you can't find your way off. You'll never find an exit ramp by yourself. Our text says there's only one way off. Christ must come and show you the way off. The Holy Spirit must open your eyes to see where that road goes and then enable you to take a turn that will turn you away from it, steer you away from this awful place called hell. Where is hell? Well, the Bible speaks of heaven as up and hell is down. We commonly talk about it that way. We're going up to heaven. People are going down to hell. But those are just relative terms. Where does up meet down? And where does east meet west? Well, heaven and hell are not earthly destinations. So when you're thinking about up and down, you need to think more about like astronauts in space. And you've seen the, the, the films, you've seen pictures of astronauts as they're in the uh, space shuttle and they're, they're turning upside down, floating around. There's no up and down for them in space. Up never meets down, down never meets up, east never meets west because those are points on the earth, not points out in space. Well, that's like heaven and hell. These are two places that never meet. They're two places that will never come together. They're so far apart, they can never reach each other. Forever apart are heaven and hell. So let's make sure we clearly understand this. Hell is a real destination. As surely as heaven is real, so is hell. Next, hell is eternal separation. In hell, you are removed forever from the presence of God. Now let me explain that. The Bible teaches that God is eminent in all of his creation. God is everywhere. He fills every space. He is in every place. Well, does that mean that God is also in hell? Well, it might surprise you. The answer is yes, that God is also in hell. It surprises many people because they think, well, no, not God. Satan is the one who keeps hell. Satan is not in hell. He's never been in hell. He's going there, but he's not the warden. Satan will be the most notorious inmate and he'll suffer the worst of all and if you want a companion in hell he'll be your companion. Satan and all of his anger against God will be in hell. Satan will not be there to stoke the flames. If anything what Satan wants to do when he gets there is to put the flames out because he's suffering in those same flames. Those same flames. Hell is a place where the body keeps burning. I've mentioned that. Now remember, we're discussing God's wrath, and God's wrath manifests itself ultimately in the punishment of hell. And yes, God is there because God is everywhere. So how do I make this statement? Hell is eternal separation from God. How is that possible? Well, we're talking about hell is a place where you are separated from all of God's benefits. That you are separated from all of God's providence. His providence is what keeps even the unbeliever who denies him and hates him. It's God's providence that keeps him alive. That keeps him breathing on this earth. And do you understand that it is the graciousness of God that keeps you from destroying yourself and others? And did you know that God restrains evil? The evil that we could do. And that's what keeps us from killing each other. Society exists only because God keeps the human heart from plunging into its deepest depravity. 
So whether you believe it, you need God. The person who hates God, who shakes his finger in the face of God, and the person who hates the Christian needs God. They live and they breathe because there is a God in its providence who keeps them alive. So they have no idea how much they depend on God for every single day of existence. Well, what would happen if God withheld that benevolence? What happens when God separates from people uh, and uh, separates from them uh, with his providence? Hell happens. Chaos happens. Up is down. Down is up. There's no sense. There's no reason. There is no hope. It's existence and non-existence. Now let me show you what happens when God no longer restrains evil. If you want to just turn over a couple of pages there to 2 Thessalonians, Paul said there's coming a day when the Holy Spirit will stop his gracious influences. In chapter 2, in verse number 7, he said, The Holy Spirit who restrains evil will remove himself. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That means the one who restrains will restrain. He will keep doing that until his restraining power is taken out of the world. Do you know what happens next? The Antichrist comes. And then he's given free reign over the earth. And with that comes the most horrible destruction the world has seen. You can read about that in Revelation. It's called the Great Tribulation. Some believe that the wrath spoken of in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 is that wrath, the wrath of tribulation, and that God will keep his church from seeing that terrible time, that day of wrath. I believe it's true. I said it last week. I believe that's true. But I don't think it's the primary meaning of 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. I believe that it intends hell. Although the tribulation does give us a very good idea of what happens when people are separated from God. In the tribulation, people will live down to their deepest depravity. The worst perversions of the human heart will be lived out. God's retribution against evil will be flung out on the earth and all of its inhabitants. Death and destruction will reign in those days. That's what happens when God withholds his providence. Fires in California, well, that'll be a relief compared to hell. Now, consider... Consider hell. In the tribulation, there is still some providence. And that's because wicked men still live. Wicked men still breathe. But in hell, that's all gone. There is no power to live. Think of this, this for just a minute. Have you ever seen someone who is suffering and struggles to get their next breath? Maybe they have lung cancer or they have asthma, severe asthma, and they struggle to get that very next breath. Have you ever seen the panic in somebody's eyes when they think, I can't get that next breath. I'm not going to be able to breathe. And they, and they, and they choke and it's almost like their eyes want to come out of their skull. They can't, they're restless. They can't, they can't even hardly uh, think and they can't move, it seems like. They're just, there's anxiety that overtakes them. That's what it's going to be like in hell. Nobody's going to be able to breathe there because God takes away breath. In hell, there is no breath. This is living death that we're talking about. It is suffocating. It's burning and intense. And it's unexplainable. God separates himself completely from sinners and all the benefits that God has for us, all the benefits that make life possible are turned into horrible, excruciating, permanent, living death. In hell... God inflicts suffering. And his justice is that people will suffer to the extent of their crimes. Sins against an infinite God require an infinite God to judge with infinite punishment. At the same time, there are degrees of punishment in hell. Well, you think, well, how could God require more than infinite suffering? How could one person suffer more than another? Well, we're talking about God, aren't we? God raises unbelievers and he gives them a body that can endure the capacity needed for suffering the amount of their sins. And so one person in hell will suffer more than another because some people sin more than others, but all suffer to their capacity. There's no relief from hell. God separates from sinners forever and there's no possibility they will repent and get out of hell. Today, you have that opportunity. 
God grants repentance and faith while you're living, but never when you're eternally dead. God's not in hell to give anybody hope. He's gone. And there is no one in hell who will repent. Nobody in hell apologizes. You know, it's interesting that you read the story of the rich man in hell in Luke. And the rich man is in hell. Abraham is in heaven. And there's a conversation that goes on between them. And there is not one word that is spoken of repentance. Now the man who is in hell, the rich man in hell, begged for mercy. And he asked for a drop of water to be placed on his tongue to cool his tongue. But he never said, I'm sorry. He never said, God is right and I'm wrong. And nobody in hell ever will. Nobody can find their own way off the broad road of destruction. And once a person goes to hell, he'll never find an exit door. There is no way to get out. God's not there to be called on. God's not there to open any doors. God's not there to grant any mercy. Mercy is for this life. It's not for the after death of hell. The same Jesus that people say is tolerant of sin is the same Jesus that said hell is forever and he said in hell there is gnashing of teeth. I think that we need to understand that in Bible times grinding the teeth, gnashing the teeth was a sign of intense rage. It's unbearable consuming anger and people in hell are that way. They're always angry. They're continually driven out of their minds with pain. They're angry at everything and everybody. There are no friends in hell. Now if people in the tribulation live down to their worst depravity, then imagine how much hatred there must be in hell. How much hatred there must be for other people in hell. They grind on each other. There's this gnashing of teeth. They bite each other. Oh, but some people say there's great comfort. Uh, we'll have comfort in hell. Friends and family will be in hell. There's no comfort. Hell is that much worse because friends and family are there because the people that you love will turn on you and you on them. Did you know that Jesus said the gospel will separate you from your family? Some of your family won't believe and they won't want you around. They won't like to have you come and visit them because you're going to say something to them about Jesus Christ. They separate from you and some of you have experienced it. Do you think that God's going to reward that person in hell with family that loves them? No, they're going to reap. They're going to reap what they've sown. They hated the Christian and they will hate each other when they get to hell. There are no family members that love each other in hell. Everybody rejects everybody. Hell separates you from God and from every other person that you love forever and ever and ever. There's no end to that. You have no idea what hell is like. Sometimes we hear people today say, Oh, I'm going through hell. My life is a living hell. That's not hell. Because the next time a problem comes along, you've lived through the first one, the next one comes along, you say, Oh, I'm living through hell. Life is hell. That's not hell. God's hell never, 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 never ends. If hell can end, heaven can end. The worth of Christ's sacrifice would not be enough to keep us in heaven if the payment was not infinite enough to keep us out of hell. One is as infinite as the other. Thirdly, hell has an immense population. Hell is heavily populated. Many, many people, vast numbers are in hell. Now, if we're asked to give a roll call of hell, who do you think is in hell? Well, the first person we would all agree on, Judas is in hell. You know, the Bible says that. Judas is in hell. And we may come to the conclusion, Hitler. Oh, he's a bad, he was a bad man. Hitler is in hell. And Stalin is in hell. Jeffrey Dahmer is in hell. Charles Manson is in hell. And for those of you thinking, you know, you may get to 25, you may get to 50 names of people that are in hell. And you might be a little bit more ambitious than that and you'll come to the conclusion, well, surely your boss is in hell, or will be. Or your mother-in-law, she'll be in hell. I'm sure of that. But you stop with that because you're just sure that people are basically good and there aren't any people, not many people that are deserving of hell, especially the ones in our circles. But how wrong that is. That's not biblical. 
You know, we are so sure almost that every reprobate that's going to be in hell. Uh, the Hollywood stars that fight for the gay rights and a woman's right to murder. Oh, their compadres say they must be in heaven. One of them dies, and you listen to the eulogies. Listen to what they say. Oh, they were pure. This, this, that God's got another angel in heaven, they say. They're going to see what hell is like. Heaven, they say, is the place where that person surely lives forever, but they are wrong. Jesus said the road is broad. He said the gate is wide because there are many people that go through it. Just to give you an idea, it was so bad when Jesus was here, there were scarcely any that were saved and on their way to heaven. The Bible tells us that Jesus came in the fullness of time. I mean, when the world was ripe, when it needed a Savior. The religious leaders were hypocrites. The politicians were liars and self-serving. If you don't believe that, just look in your Bible and read the tweets. Oh, wait, my notes are mixed up. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Does that tell us things never change? The human heart is always against God. Who is going to heaven? Very few. Jesus did many miracles, wiped out disease in Israel. After he raised people from the dead, what did they do? They yelled their hatred of him. Crucify him, crucify him, they said. There were few that believed. How would you think that those who have never seen Christ, those who have never seen one miracle that Jesus did, how do you think that those would be more inclined to believe him than those who actually saw it all? Has the world changed? Well, we can say Christianity has grown for sure in the succeeding centuries. By the grace of God, there are many people that have believed. But at the same time, Christianity has become the most distorted, hypocritical religion of all. The worst enemies of the cross are those who claim that they preach in Christ's name from pulpits just like this one, and yet they lead millions of people to hell. Their broadcasts go around the world by satellite television preaching a word, a gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are people that I think we would say are worse than Judas because they lead more people astray. They have more opportunity to lead people astray. They betray Christ. In past centuries, there was the worldwide domination of Catholicism with priests and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and popes that were vile abusers. That's a matter of history. You can read that. And it seems like the same thing is true today, isn't it? The per you just read it in the paper. The perversions of that system. But now new perversions have arrived in Christianity. We have the Word of Faith movement today. It has ministers that steal from gullible people. Christianity is polluted. A few days ago, I, I drove down Fulton and I saw a, a Lutheran church that has a rainbow. And it said, God loves you the way that you are. And I would say to that, yes, because God loves sinners and God will save you, but he won't leave you the way that you are. The rainbow is a distortion of God's grace. Hypocrites among hypocrites are invisible. Hypocrites among believers stick out like a sore thumb. Well, what does all of this mean? Well, sad to say, it, it, it means almost assuredly that every face that you see, nearly every face that you see at work, and you see at school, and at the mall, nearly every person that you talk to on social media, if you could see them, you see somebody that's on their way to hell. Millions die that way, and there aren't any good enough to escape it. Millions die that way because they don't have the way, the truth, and the life. You count all the numbers going back to, to wicked Cain, all the people that have died without knowledge of God. Go back to the time of Noah. I mean, the Bible tells us about that. When Noah lived, the world was populated. There's only eight people in the entire world that were on their way to heaven. The rest of them perished in the flood. So they went from a deluge of water sufficient to drown all of them to a place where there's never another drop of water. Peter said, as it was in the days of Noah. And today it is as it was in the days of Noah. There's hardly a place where you find a believer. The wrath of God is coming. Hell is coming for all who will not repent 
and come to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that brings me to this last truth about hell. Hell is avoided by salvation. Only salvation in Christ will keep you out of hell. There's no other way. Only Jesus can deliver from the wrath to come. John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. That's the word of God. You can't argue with that. If you know Christ you have everlasting life. If you don't then you'll not see life. For all of those who think there are a dozen ways to get to heaven, a hundred ways to get to heaven, doesn't make any difference what religion you are. Well, Christianity is not one of those that admits to many other ways. There's only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, not everlasting death. And here's the good news, that hell is not a must for anybody but an unbeliever. Hell is certain only for unbelievers because our passage says Jesus Christ delivers from the wrath to come who is a believer did God exclude anyone and say well there's only certain ones that can come you have to be only so tall or you must be this short or you must be this rich or you must be this poor or you must be this sociable you must be this race he didn't say anything like that and so we ask, is there anybody who's outside the grace and the mercy of God? And I would say, yes, the ones who don't believe. As long as they stay in their unbelief, they'll go to the place where is there, there is no grace and no mercy of God possible for them. But as you live and breathe today, every person, all they need to do is repent and come to Jesus Christ. Anybody who comes to Jesus Christ repenting and believing in him will avoid the wrath to come. The way of salvation is not the way that you think. It's not, it's not the method that you have devised. It's not that you wish that God just tolerates your sin. No, the way to avoid the wrath to come is to give up everything you are. To give up every vice that you have. To surrender every wicked way. Everything that God says in his word is sin. You must surrender all of it and give your life to Christ. That's what we call repentance and faith in Jesus Christ alone. You'll not be saved any other way. The scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, so he will save you in your sins, and then he'll take the sin out of you, the sinner. He'll not let you stay in it. If you're not prepared for that, and if you say, no, I plan to get saved, I want to get saved, but you know, I'd really like to hold on to this thing that I do. I really enjoy that. Uh, it, it may not be what God wants, but I enjoy that. And ha after all, who's in charge here? No, you can't come to God and say, I'd like to preserve this sin. This is the thing that I'd like to do. The wrath of God abides on that person. They won't be saved. Now, nobody goes to hell by God's fault. And I also say this, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. Giving up things does not save you. You can give up a whole list of things. It'll never save you. I'm talking about when you understand that you can't hold on to anything because Jesus Christ came to die for sin and he's not going to let sin stay in you and say well it's okay if you go ahead and sin he's not going to do that he, he died for it did I say it's so hard for us to understand Jesus Christ the Son of God God himself died can you imagine that he would go through that and then allow you to live in your sin no, you have, you've got to understand that. You've got to understand that and be willing to give it up because that's the kind of faith that God puts in your heart. So nobody goes to hell by God's fault. The fault is yours. Anybody hears the message in this audience today, anybody that hears it by recording, you've heard the word that God saves from hell. And if you die, that's not my fault. If you die without Christ, it's not God's fault, it's not my fault, it's your fault. And if you are that self-deceived, self-confessed Christian who hasn't really, hasn't really met Christ by walking through the narrow gate, that fault is yours, nobody but yours. Many want to go to heaven, 
but they want to carry all the baggage they have with them. It's like, it's like going to the airport and going through one of those narrow turnstiles and you've got the bags hanging off your side and they're poking out here and you're trying to squeeze through that turnstile and you turn this way and that way and you try to figure out a way to get through it. You can't. You got to lay it all aside. You got to put it all down. You can't get through the straight gate, the narrow gate, with all of that baggage. You've got to put it down and walk through to meet Christ stripped of everything that you are. So you never ask this question, will God tolerate me? Will God tolerate those things that I claim are my identity? No. You have no right to any identity but the one that God gave in the creation. In heaven, only blood-bought sinners, cleansed from every sin, made white with the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be there. If that's not the way you come, you'll never get through the gate. Hell is avoided by surrendering everything so that you pass through the narrow gate to eternal life. That's the only exit off the broad way. Now hear me as we finish today. Hell is real. Hell is fire and brimstone. Hell is inescapable, everlasting. It's a burning lake of fire. Hell has an immense population. And if you die and go there, you're just one more that adds to the number without Christ. God will judge and God will punish. You can be sure of that. Wrath is coming. And the only way out is salvation. You've got to get off that road to hell and avoid the wrath to come by going to the cross. You've got to see Jesus lifted, lifted up for sin to pay that infinite price that God required. You've got to come and see the place where Jesus lay. Come to the tomb, see the tomb is empty and that he's risen to deliver his people from the wrath to come. Hell is real and so is heaven for believers in Jesus Christ. Now, if you just listen to these closing verses, Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We've spoken no vain words today. Everything that I've told you comes straight from the Word of God. The Word that is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Hear the Word of God that says... But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, what? We shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Mark it down, save it, read it every day. Only Jesus delivers from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.brianbaptist.com. Be Baptist dot org.